Um, welcome to the last session of uh, the Multimedia Media Conf at LCA this year. Um, this year at LCA we're very lucky to have developers of the two uh, free Flash implementations. Um, Ian Hobart, uh, Benjamin Noddy of Swift Tech, and Rob Savoy from Gnash. Um, so uh, Benjamin is actually giving a talk at the, at the main conference at 4 p.m. on Thursday about Swift Deck. I'm going to get him up to um, give a brief talk uh, about what he's going to talk about now. Um, and then when he's done, uh, Rob's going to give a much longer talk about, um, about Ganache and about reverse engineering, about legal methods of reverse engineering, proprietary network protocols, tools, and techniques. Um, <coughs> it's actually uh, his, uh, I hear his uh, preparing this as one of the main talks at FOSDEM in a few weeks' time. So I if anyone here is going to FOSDEM? No? Excellent. So you'll get to see it first. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, um, but first, Benjamin, tell us about Swift Deck. Yeah, so, uh, hi, I'm Benjamin Otter. I'm the, de the lead developer of Swift Deck, which uh, is a Flash player that I started picking up two years ago. Basically, the whole idea of it was uh, I was watching yet, uh, finding yet another link to some YouTube videos and couldn't watch it. So I set out to solve that problem with the simple attitude of every open source developer. It can't be that hard to make it work. And uh, now it's two years later. <laughs> YouTube works these days, but it turns out on the internet there's more flash files than just YouTube. I'd say it's pretty good what we manage to play these days. On the other hand, by the amount of complaining people that have come to IRC and I get emails from, it's still not enough. I'll leave it at that. Um, the biggest problem I've encountered is that it's pretty hard to make a, a Flash player work that works exactly the same as a closed source implementation that you don't have any specifications for. I used to compare this to um, Firefox and Safari WebKit, which are two browsers that actually do have a specification and do actually work together to make their browsers work the same. But still, every website needs to detect those two. So that explains how hard something like that is. Um, yeah, SwiftTech has managed so far to be the GNOME Flash player, and it will be the default Flash player in the next Debian release, so it's actually quite good. All the Debian people quite stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you can decide it for yourself. And I'll give over to Rob. So I'll be honest, I actually wrestled really hard. How do we explain reverse engineering hex dumps? So ask lots of questions, it'll probably be almost easier because, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a hard subject to explain. I've done a lot of reverse engineering over the last 20 years. I used to maintain all the GDB backends, so uh, I spent a bunch of years doing GDB backends for a long time and then did a lot of uh, network protocols for lots of weird people like NASA and a lot of other strange people. And um, So hopefully I can explain this somewhat, um, we'll find out here. Um, so basically, um, I founded a, a nonprofit a year or so ago called Open Media Now, and we do a lot of work in the technical space of patent-free codecs, flash players, whoa, and a bunch of other stuff. And so we're based in Colorado, we have people all over the place, and we unfortunately work a lot with lawyers. But um, you'll see that it turns out to be a good idea to have lawyers helping you out. Um, this thing must be on a timer, shit. Um, basically, um, 
It's a flash player. You can read the features. I probably don't need to read all this. We support lots of different renderers, GUIs, YouTube, a lot of stuff. Um, Internet Archive is using us for streaming, Vorbis and Theor these days. Um, a bunch of other people are using us. And uh, Ganache is on about 10 or 15 different consumer devices shipping out of Taiwan and Hong Kong and things like that. Um, I j also just wrote a uh, clone of the Adobe Media Server, which is what caused all of this reverse engineering work to actually have to happen. And um, it, there's a couple of other free media servers like Red5 and Wowza, but none of them support the, what's called server-side action script, which uh, we actually will be doing pretty soon. It's going to be an alpha release in the next Ganache release, which should be out roughly the end of next month. If anybody here likes hacking media servers, I'd love to take this from a solo project and throw some more bodies at it. Um, just a quick marketing spiel crap here. Well, and it's basically, as Ben said, you know, we play a lot of content, but Flash is complex. There's a lot of bugs, so like, usually we don't do everything else. This is going to drive me crazy. Um, same basic thing, C++. We use a lot of different libraries. We're insanely portable. God damn it. We, uh, does anyone know how to turn the timer off? I don't know how to open office. I thought... Uh, just, anyway. so, um, but anyway, we're on about 50 different computer systems. We run in raw frame buffers and lots of other stuff. Oh, man, this is going to be cr difficult. Okay. Um, anyway, yeah, so we, we're very, very big in performance stuff because we run on a lot of really brain-dead embedded platforms. And, um, oh, man. Here, I'll let somebody else drive. Um, <laughs> Escape. it manually? That should be it. You can tell I don't do that many slideshows. I usually just talk and ramble for a long time. <laughs> um, let's see. But anyway, yes, yeah, so we're, we're actually very, very portable. And one of the things we found out is that uh, Portability is actually not that hard. And you know, doing free software is one thing, but I'm a big believer that those of us who do free software should try and infect all the other proprietary software out there. So we actually run on everything from Solaris to HPUX, Windows, Darwin. It's a bit ridiculous, and people make fun of us, but it's kind of fun doing software that runs on practically any device I've ever dropped it on. Um, we're real big on performance, which makes a big difference with some of the cell phone companies that are using um, Ganache and stuff. Um, a lot more performance work is coming out soon, but we're, we basically are now doing full screen video at about 10% CPU load, 1900 by 1600 resolution, which is pretty cool, especially at 400 megahertz. <laughs> um, so anyway, what is RTMP? I mean, basically, RTMP is Adobe's proprietary network protocol that they use for much higher quality streaming. Um, you know, you don't see it on YouTube because Adobe's media server costs a huge amount of money, so they wind up using HTTP. Um, but RTMP is used for video conferencing group where it basically supports transferring extremely complex action script objects um, written in Flash players to other Flash players over the network. And it's kind of a brain dead protocol, to be honest. But, um, but it's very useful if you're into the Flash world because it's really how Flash players communicate with other Flash players. And also lets you do a lot better video seeking and stuff. So for instance, like server side video editing and things, you'd use RTMP, not HTTP. Um, oh, yeah, and the BBC is using it for DRM, which is a drag. <laughs> um, there's about 10 different variations. These are the main ones. Um, basically, RTMP more or less describes using what's called encoded AMF objects over variations, you know, HTTP, SSL connections, encryption, the new UDP one, but they're all roughly the same with just slightly different protocols wrapped around it. Um, and so basically, as I said, you know, why does this matter? Um, one of the original reasons that RTMP came about was trying to do things like handling network congestion. It's actually a pretty old protocol, um, sort of back in crappy modems and dial-up days and things. And so, for instance, if you're, you're you know, 
basically if your congestion goes up, they start dropping frames and they do a lot of sensing and stuff. And the idea is to try and give you a theoretically better quality viewing experience. I mean, quality and YouTube don't really fit in the same sentence, but that's what they think they were doing. Um, the other advantage is you can do seeking on the server side, which is actually very useful. If you've ever wanted to like watch the last 10% of a video with YouTube, you wind up waiting for the first 90% to get loaded and then you can kind of do the rest. And this is also very heavily used for um, commercial groupware and uh, video conferencing. I was at a video conference a few months ago and every single company was using Flash. It was disgusting. <laughs> So basically, you know, it's like, why reverse engineer something? I mean, it's kind of a lot of work, and it's sort of equivalent to beating your head against the wall much of the time. And, uh, and basically, in this case, it's we wanted to access stuff we normally couldn't do it any other way. I mean, without RTMP, we can't do server-side seeking. We can't do video conferencing very well. We can't do a lot of the really fun stuff that I wanted to do as we're trying to uh, sort of take over the Flash technology from Adobe. You know, we sort of have to implement all their functionality in a sense. Um, and so that's why we did it. Um, there's a lot of different ways of reverse engineering. Um, we don't do it the FFmpeg technique. We actually believe in clean room reverse engineering. It's a lot easier that way. And, and funny enough is, I mean, some people play video games. The rest of us get great fun out of decoding hex dumps. Um, you know, some of us are wired wrong, but it turns out to be useful on occasion. Um, and I always point this out because I'm, I'm sure everybody's seen The Matrix, but, um, but it's got a point. I mean, at one point, you're looking at a hex dump and you're going, oh my god, what is this mess? But eventually, when you stare at it long enough and you start to understand it, you really do see what's there behind it. And, um, and unfortunately, it's a bit more of an intuitive thing than a necessary technique, but it does work. So, um, so one of the couple of tricks that I found, and I'll see if I can come up with more later on, is... Um, yeah, I'll get into packet dumping tools anyway. Um, for one thing, when you're doing packet sniffing, use really big packet sizes. Um, a lot of times, it's really hard to tell where a frame is when you're grabbing you know, a network dump and stuff. But often, the, the you know, TCP dump and all the other tools that I'll get into in a bit um, will get the entire thing in one big chunk. And that's kind of what you want to do, because the first part in reverse engineering is knowing that you have the entire message. There's nothing more frustrating than trying to decode a hex dump and not having all the data in the same packet because things like length fields give you the wrong information and all that kind of thing. Um, the other thing is that, amazingly, most protocols have a huge amount of ASCII strings. And so a lot of times, the strings can give you a lot of clues. Um, I know that with RTMP, that was kind of the first place that I started was you find the string and then you want to figure out you know, kind of what it does. And so once you eliminate the strings, you've started and you started figuring things out and then from there you can keep on going. Um, my other philosophy is you write a lot of code and you throw away a lot of code. Um, the only way to, when you're reverse engineering, the only way to really test if your idea is correct is to write the code and see if it works, um, which often it doesn't. And you wind up beating it and throwing it away. But often it works out really well because once you get something kind of reproducible, then you go, ah, I got it. Well, and then six months later you find out you were wrong and you rewrite it again. But trying to reverse engineer stuff and like write a specification without writing code is ridiculous. Um, it's just you won't get anywhere. Um, I also find it sounds funny, I like a really relaxed environment. My, my number one key, I think, thing for reverse engineering is I'll make a big pot of tea, I turn up the stereo really loud, and just get into it. Um, sometimes that's what it takes. It, I couldn't imagine trying to do this work in an office. It's really distracting. People want to ask you to stuff all the time. And a lot of times when you get into decoding hex dumps, you really have to stare at it a long time. And it's... Uh, I don't know, you just you stare at it, you stare at it, and you stare at it, and you start to see the relationships between things, and you see certain things repeatedly. And I know it sounds funny, but it does actually work that way. Um, and I feel pretty easy. I mean, RTMP wasn't that hard. I know some guys who uh, reverse engineered GSM encryption, and they're staring at terabyte network dumps. So I felt like I had it actually a lot easier than they did. Um, and the other thing is getting started, um, kind of why I start with ASCII strings. I mean, reverse engineering something from hex is really discouraging. You, you beat your head against the wall and it's really hard to get started, but once you get started and you get something working, you go, oh, cool, and then you go off to the next thing. It's like working your way up through the levels of a good video game. Um, this slide should unfortunately be longer, but there's a lot of common functionality between almost all network protocols. Um, I wanted to say, like, all protocols have a header, but not all do. Um, 
most is a little bit more accurate. But most protocols do have a header, and, and most, head, most headers have a length field. Um, and that actually, I know it sounds really funny, but decoding the headers is kind of the key to figuring out what is encapsulated within that header. Um, some protocols have checksums, which sounds funny, but you can write code that will analyze all the numbers in a file, and you can figure out where the checksum byte is, and it's usually the last one. It's kind of nice for finding your frame within the whole packet dump. Um, the other trick is, too, is all numbers are big Indian. Um, pretty much network byte order is big Indian. Um, we all pretty much probably hear, everybody here is probably on a little Indian machine. So, um, you know, you forget about that kind of stuff. But, uh, but knowing that your numbers are big Indian just means that when you look at stuff, you're not going to see a one. You're going to see some other value. Um, and flashes is really fun because they only use doubles for numbers. So it gets really complicated. You know, number one is like 0x3f something or other. It's kind of a pain in the neck. Um, and then staying legal is important um, because if you don't stay legal, you can't give anybody the results of your work. Um, so there's a couple of, well, actually, there's an entire huge paper on how to do this legally, especially in the United States. But don't disassemble executables. That's tacky. Anybody can do that. That's no fun. Um, <laughs> It, it just And then you can't do anything about it because that's a complete, at least in my country, uh, total DMCA violation. Um, one of the key things that I've been taught is that if you're reverse engineering proprietary software, you must have legal copies. This is very interesting in the Flash world because to get legal copies of Flash tools, the licensing agreement forbids you from working on Flash players. But luckily I have kids. <laughs> I just steal their laptop. Um, and talk to real lawyers. I meet a lot of people not just in the free software world, but other things that I do that like to think they know all about law and legalities and they interpret things and they split hairs and, you know, talk to real lawyers. Real lawyers are totally worth it. Um, we all can interpret things one way, but lawyers interpret it the way other people's lawyers interpret it. And it's very, very important to us. And I've been lucky to have good uh, pro bono legal help to sort of explain a lot of these legalities. Um, the one that most people have heard of too is separation between people writing the specifications. You know, one of the classic ways people have done this is somebody analyzes something potentially illegally, writes specifications, they give it to other people who then wind up implementing it. Um, classically, I wind up not doing it that way, but that's actually a lot easier way to do this and not worry so much about all the fine lines. And, and another key is don't live in the U.S. The DMCA is evil. Um, unfortunately, I do, so I pay a lot of attention to this thing. Um, so anyway, more into the more fun stuff. There's a lot of different tools floating around the internet for basically doing reverse engineering. So um, TCP dump is actually one of my favorites. It's kind of the old tool. It's been around for a long time. It's a bit low level, but it works really, really good. Um, there's a newer tool. It's about a, I don't know, it's probably about a year or two old called ngrep that uh, I've found that is actually very nice for a lot of different protocols. Um, it's a little different than TCP dump. Um, but sometimes having multiple tools with different output formats shows you different patterns in the sort of mix. So it's good to use multiple tools because you're looking for the thing that looks the same, and that's sort of the key pattern you're looking for. Um, Wireshark is another good one, even if it doesn't support your protocol, because it's a nice convenient way of capturing packet dumps and separating it by port numbers and kind of analyzing things. And even though in Wireshark may just say, Here's a blob of data. It's up to you to figure it out. Um, it's still really good for, for grabbing data. Um, in our case, once we reverse engineered this, the Wireshark people contacted us, and bang, they wound up with RTMP support too. Well, that's kind of nice. Now I use Wireshark to check my own code. It's kind of fun. Um, display tools. Um, displaying your information, your hex dumps, in a lot of different ways is really important because different patterns show up with different formats. Um, I actually use OD a lot. I bet most people here have never even heard of OD. I mean, OD's been around since like the dawn of Unix-based systems. Um, and uh, it actually works pretty good. I mean, it's kind of low level, but I don't know. I find it very useful, and, and I have some other OD tricks I'll get into. Um, GDB, believe it or not, once you start writing code, you've got something you can load into a debugger. And often you wind up wandering through, looking at memory buffers and looking at stuff and you know, incrementing address to see what's in offsets and things like that. And GDB is really kind of a nice thing that rather than recompiling all the time, you can just play around in GDB and sort of you know, look at memory buffers and things like that. Um, NGREP, again, also displays things in various different ways. And uh, same thing for TCP dump. Um, you don't often actually have to edit the hex, but sometimes you do. Sometimes you want to change a field to sort of see if it 
does what you think it does, like change a string to a number, change the length of something, things like that. Um, so I use GHEX too. It's actually pretty good for people that like GUIs. I'm not a big GUI person, but, uh, but GHEX too actually works um, pretty good. I mean, Emacs, of course, can do anything, so of course you edit files with Emacs. I mean, I'm a GNU guy, so I don't have much choice. And Vim, believe it or not, actually lets you edit binary files too, but um, why I'd want to edit in VI, I don't really know. And there's a lot of other projects out there. I mean, there's whole pages on binary editors and stuff. Just pick one that actually works. It's kind of the least critical part. Um, basically a couple of tools. Um, I basically took the same packet and tried to show people the different display options. So GHEX is kind of nice. You can look at stuff and it highlights things and you can skip around. And, and it's kind of fun if you're into the mouse click GUI thing. Um, Emacs binary mode actually is kind of useful. I do a bunch of, I use Emacs actually really heavily for decoding hex dumps. Um, I've got some other slides later about that. Um, and it's kind of useful, as I said, sometimes you want to look at stuff and just play around and put the limiters in and really analyze exactly what's going on. Um, VI, of course, just to make the VI people happy. It's a little hard because them funny control characters kind of drive you crazy. Um, I do a lot of this, believe it or not. Um, I'll often take a hex dump. For instance, the in the upper corner, that is the output of OD. And basically, I whack it into a text editor because in this case, I kind of knew what all the fields were. So each of those lines is a separate element within ActionScript in the RTMP protocol, and I often will just take the raw hex dump and then just put line breaks in where I know all the, the fields separate and just kind of look at it, and then I often actually add color coding. I mean, color coding sounds really tacky. It makes a nice documentation, but it's sometimes it's really useful. Um, I've got a big chart on one of our websites with all these packets decoded and color coded. And you look at it and you go, oh, wow, I understand this protocol pretty good. You see the patterns really good. I mean, this is a short example. Most of them are a lot longer, but they don't fit on a slide. Um, but it, funny enough, yeah, I use Emacs and OpenOffice a lot for decoding stuff. Um, when you start out long enough, you can kind of decode by eye, and so then you're just trying to make it easier for yourself. Um, so TCP dump. It's got a bunch of different options. These are pretty much the main ones anybody needs to use. Um, dash S, big sizes, are like 3,000. That's usually a good number bigger than that is okay too, because to me pretty much it'll stop reading data when it hits the end of the packet. So when you write data to the network, typically that's kind of where when you're sniffing it, it'll stop right there. So with a big packet size, you can kind of get the whole thing. Um, dash capital X, basically dump the ASCII where it's found. You'll see in some of my other slides that, I mean, eventually you can learn to read ASCII and hex, but it's a lot more complicated than it should be. So this dash X option is very, very useful, especially if you're doing things like um, RTMPT, which is action script objects over HTTP. It gives you all the HTTP header stuff. You can ignore it because that's documented and you know, that's an easy one and things like that. Of course, you have to specify a device. Um, one of the other things about reverse engineering is never sniff anybody else's network connection. Big, bad idea. Um, only sniff your own network connection, preferably the local host one. It keeps you out of a lot of trouble, believe it or not. Um, the port, of course, is pretty easy. And dash L, I, uh, I have a tendency when I run these things to pipe everything through the T. <laughs> um, if you sniff other networks, I've been advised by my lawyers at the EFF that I can get sued. Huh? Yeah, I have been told that the reason you don't sniff other people's networks is that they may get upset, and whether there's not really anything you've done, it's sort of tacky. So, like, if you aimed your, you know, TCP dump at so somebody's server, that's, in a sense, an invasion of privacy, I guess. Um, but it, it sets you up for potential legal problems. Well, that's amazing. That's worse than the U.S. Um, but anyway, and it's just, it's just tacky. Um, so anyway, I only sn sniff my local host, typically. Um, I mean, you can sniff your own internal subnet. I just sniff my local machine most of the time. It's a lot easier. Um, but anyway, so I pipe my output into the T program and cat it to a file all the time so that I can grep things later. And dash L is nice because it gets all your buffering right in TCP dump. Otherwise, it gets a little funky. Um, basically, here's an example of TCP dump output. I stare at these things an awful lot. Um, I picked an HTTP one just so you could see that it was kind of how something with massive ASCII can look really confusing when you're staring at the hex. 
Um, and you can kind of see the options that I used in here, big packet size and pretty much all the stuff I just went into. Um, NGREP is sort of got a lot of the similar options to TCP dump. They're different just enough to drive me crazy, um, but it roughly works about the same way, um, ports and devices and sizes and ASCII. And you can see that it actually dumps stuff sort of differently anyway. It likes to put in more spaces, it likes to adjust things, all that. This is actually a decoded RTMP message, the result of the initial network connection packet that RTMP uses. And you can see that, you know, if you see the ASCII, it's a lot easier to read. <laughs> OD, of course, my all-time favorite. There's a lot of different options. Most of them don't work well together, but um, it has its advantages. So pretty much here's a couple of different versions of OD output. Um, I do this an awful lot. It works out pretty good, and I load it into Emacs and bang away on it and do different things. Um, TCP dump's got some strange stuff, so I like to put in a big width and blow it out and stuff. And you can see that you can't dump ASCII and hex at the same time, which is about the only downside, but, but it's kind of useful. Um, and I use this a lot for actually making test cases. Wireshark, of course. In this case, it's easy because, uh, yeah, in this case, it actually already was, this is a, a recent snapshot, so it was already supporting RTMP at one point. But, you know, Wireshark's actually pretty nice. I mean, even if it doesn't know your protocol, I like it for manipulating my way through masses of packets and things, because you often wind up with hundreds and hundreds of packets you're looking through, and you want to find something. And it's, uh, Wireshark's pretty nice. I mean, I don't know what happened to Ethereal, but Wireshark is definitely a, a tool I use a lot. Um, and then, of course, GDB. Um, I mean, I'm probably, probably everybody here has used GDB, but a lot of people never use the examine option, I found out. Um, GDB is, is really, really good for taking things apart, and there's a lot of obscure options there, and there's a lot of variance. And so in this case, this is just a simple example of, of taking the same packet that's been in some of the other examples and just basically dumping the data behind it. Um, in this case, like, I've got an address in there, and if I'm looking for a particular offset, um, a lot of files will give you an offset and you want to see what's behind there. I can just do simple point arithmetic in GDB and it's, I mean it's not really a scripting environment but it, it works pretty good for just playing around with binary files. Um, so basically an RTMP message has a header. Um, I can't tell you how long it took to figure out what the headers looked like because it gets pretty strange but um, once you figure it out it seems to make lots of sense. Um, <laughs> and so pretty much this is you know, what we spend a lot of time figuring out. Um, there's a lot of stuff they use for the protocol. The way they do handshakes and stuff turned out to be um, a lot of what appeared to be random data at one point. Then I figured out later that it was full of timestamps and a lot of stuff like that. But once you get rid of all the handshake stuff, um, you know, you wind up with a bunch of binary dumps, which I'll get into. And so this is roughly what the headers look like. When I get into the other slides, you'll start to see this basic format a whole bunch of times. Um, RTMP supports uh, multiple types of messages. In this case, this is a, a 14. It's an invoke. It's like a remote function call. So you might you know, make your network connection, and you may make some other function call to it and say, you know, play this network stream or whatever else. And this actually turns out to be the real power of using RTMP for, for Flash and stuff, is that the ability to load Flash objects onto the server and then do remote executions on them. Most video conferencing software actually writes the server side in Flash, loads it onto the server, and so when everybody connects to like a video chat, they get the list of names and all that kind of junk. And it's all done basically through remote function calls. Um, Flash is incredibly heavily timestamp based, so they put timestamps everywhere on everything. Classically in three different ways I've discovered. I think they just added them as time went on without really thinking about it. Um, and there's even a, a bit of a source field. You can tell, oh, is this message coming from the server? Is this message coming from the client? I always thought it was obvious, but whatever. They added a field for it. Oh, and the other fun part is there's multiple header sizes for RTMP. This is actually the hardest part of, of reverse engineering RTMP was most protocols, the header's the same size. It's, you know, it's whatever it is, it's always that. Unfortunately, Adobe didn't see it that way. So one of the things as we found out is that there's basically a bit field used to signify the header. And they mostly did this to save bandwidth, basically. The first message you get for something is usually the 12-byte the header. And then typically, if you're sending a lot of data, like a video stream or a really big object and things, then they use the smaller header sizes to basically just save a few bytes with each packet. Um, it seems a bit ridiculous, but 
whatever. That's kind of the way it worked. Um, AMF is basically the, the name of an encoded ActionScript object. I mean, ActionScript is more or less the same as JavaScript, ECMAScript 262. And so when you've encoded into the binary form, it's called AMF. There's two different formats. There's AMF0, which has kind of been around for quite a while, which is the predominant one. It turns out not to be very compact. And so now they've got an AMF3 that came out in Flash 9, which is a much more compact representation. In Adobe's great wisdom, they like to pass like integers that could have a range of like 1 to 60 using a double, 8 bytes, kind of stupid. So they added an integer type, which they still use from 1 to 64. They chopped tr down ASCII from 8 bytes or 8 bits down to 6. They do all this weird stuff in AMF3, but, but more, it's more or less the same. And, and I haven't actually seen too many websites using AMF3 yet at all, but I'm sure it'll start to uh, be more popular as things go on. Um, so here's an example of an encoded AMF object. I have a lot more of these on our website, but it would be kind of boring going through all the different data types. And so pretty much this is how it looks. So almost all encoded AMF objects have a type field. This is really common between most network protocols that under have multiple data types. You know, if you're just streaming video, it's kind of one thing. But uh, there's usually almost always a type field someplace. And so in this case, you know, it's a 0, 2. That's the, the type field for a string. This is really easy to figure out, as I said, because once you find your strings, um, it was pretty obvious that you count how many characters are in the string. Oh, look, this t these two bytes is the length of the string. Therefore, the byte in front of it must be the type field. That was easy. After that, it got more interesting. But, um, but that's pretty common for a lot of stuff. So, um, And most of the other AMF objects are roughly the same. They just change the type field, which changes stuff. The, Adobe does it kind of arbitrary. Some objects have terminating bytes. Some have length fields. It's kind of strange, but... Uh, but this is a pretty simple one. Um, testing. Um, it, it may sound funny, but I mention testing now because I actually find that writing test cases while I'm developing the software helps me figure out if I'm doing it correctly. Um, I do an awful lot of, of captures. I take the binary data. Um, I'll show you an example in a minute. I typically use one of the other tools to produce the hex dump. And then when I'm writing my own software, because reverse engineering, it's one thing. I actually wrote my own server and client side implementations of this protocol. And so as I got into decoding and encoding more and more complex objects, basically I made a, um, I pretty much sniffed for hours and stuff and got all this data, made test cases, then I can make sure that my encoding's correct. The nice thing is that when reverse engineering, you often will work on something and three weeks later you'll find a different packet and you'll go, oh man, everything I thought I understood, I was wrong. And having a lot of test cases is great because when you refactor your code, you can get back to where you started very quickly. If you don't have test cases, it's really hard to get back to your starting point. Um, I use a lot of uh, disk-based files and I do a bunch of sort of more dynamic stuff. And, um, and I just think testing is important, um, it's especially with binary protocols because a, a little mistake is a big one. So, for instance, here's kind of an example of the kind of test cases that we've been writing lots of. Um, we use Deja GNU, the GNU regression testing format for a lot of stuff. This is a pretty simple one. So, I had taken OD and made a, a hex dump. Buffer class is pretty obvious and stuff. And then basically I parse that and then I want to examine all of the elements that after parsing it, which has been returned in my data structure. And I write I have thousands of these in various different forms for different stuff. But the advantage is, is I, can, I can see what it's going in. If I want to, I can test encoding and decoding functions in the same test case, display my encoded version against the sort of golden version that I sniffed and stuff. And often you stare at it and you go, oh, I got this one byte wrong and things like that all the time. Um, and I actually literally developed the test cases almost before I developed the code uh, and sort of developed them together. Um, another one is that often when, oh, somebody's falling asleep already. <laughs> um, <laughs> another problem is when you're sniffing stuff, you want to kind of get rid of the crap and get to where you want to. So um, funny enough is ignore the TCP IP headers. You don't really care. You know, the real guts in this place is pretty much down where, in this case, it, uh, HT, HTTP command just to make it easier to find. Pretty much just drop the first 52 bytes. That's your Ethernet packet and your TCP IP header and sort of like fif byte 53 and onward is your real data. And people go crazy trying to decode, you know, like some protocol and it turns out they're like accidentally decoding Ethernet. I've seen people get lost there for weeks. 
dots. So, so basically, here's a hex dump. <laughs> this is usually what you wind up looking at and going, oh man, what is this thing? Um, you can see if you look at the top line, there's the RTMP header that I had earlier, 03, yada, yada, 14, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so first I usually go in and look for all the ASCII strings. Um, that's usually a lot easier and eliminate all that kind of stuff. Um, because once you see that, even in a binary protocol, this one's particular one, it's 90% ASCII. And since I had already figured out how strings were encoded and decoded, this is a nice easy one. Um, and once you get all the easy stuff out of the way, then the harder stuff becomes a lot more simple. Um, basically then, the, the other ones in the green, that's a double. Um, right there, zero, 00 is the f data type for an AMF um, double, basically. And so 3FF0, actually that's a 1. <laughs> uh, I have a whole chart somewhere of all the doubles printed in big Indian order sitting next to my terminal so I can find all these things. Said okay. Um, so yeah, okay. So I'll go back there. So basically, once you go through it all, and as I said, I like to do this a lot. I break everything down into a text editor. I put in carriage returns. I add color coding, and so that nice obscure black and white hex dump basically was this. Um, in this case, this message has the terminator in orange on the bottom. That's the how an action script object says, that, "Oh, you got to the end." It doesn't actually have a byte field because you may have nested objects. Um, so I'll wrap this up quick. And so basically people go, oh, how can I help? Translations. Um, this is more applicable to Ganache, but also to our server. Um, we believe in supporting multiple languages. And so a lot of people, I mean, this is a developer audience, but a lot of times people, we like it when people translate it. We believe in supporting error messages in different languages. Um, in, in, the, in the Flash world, we love testing. Most of us don't browse the entire internet every day. And so people testing and giving us really good bug reports. I use this compiler, this Linux distribution, yada, yada. This website breaks like this is very, very helpful for, to us because most of the Ganache developers don't actually run any of the Adobe tools, so we don't really have anything to compare it against. Um, documentation is another important one. The documentation I wrote for Ganache and Signal and RTMP is pretty, almost as dense as a hex dump. So people that actually know how to write real documentation that makes sense to mere mortals would be really wonderful. Um, we're big on build farms. If anybody here does systems administration and wants to help out, we could use a new sysadmin for our, our build farm, which is kind of critical for supporting many machines. Um, especially in this case, RTMP it was inherently designed as a 32-bit protocol. But our, our implementation runs on 64-bit machines, both big and little Indian, which Adobe hasn't quite figured out yet. But maintaining a build farm turns out to be a huge project and a big time drain, and uh, I'm really getting tired of doing it myself. Um, I have to throw in the funding, the funding bit in there. Um, it's really hard to concentrate on this stuff if you're starving to death. You need to keep a roof over your head. And, and I have to mention free beer because people actually send us free beer. It's very amusing. Um, I went to the post office one day and I got a big box and the postmaster goes, what's that? Oh, I said it's a six pack from Sweden. She goes, you can't do that. <laughs> and I said, but it's already here. She goes, oh, okay. <laughs> but sometimes beer is the only way to get through a uh, serious reverse engineering projects. You can lose interest really easily. It just trick us not to start on the free beer too early in the day. Um, and then basically I have to kind of list a lot of our supporters. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Software Freedom Law Center have given us huge amounts of legal help and actually helping us reverse engineer contracts, patents, and a lot of things. And without them, I think we'd be in big trouble. And uh, I have to mention some of the other people that have helped fund a lot of this work for the last year, John Gilmore, Bob Young, and Mark Shuttleworth. They're big, big supporters of free software, and they continue to be so. so. Any questions? Uh, uh, I'm actually, I don't have any Windows machines, so it would be hard for me to use a Windows application for capturing packets. <laughs> Oh, okay. So what was that called? OSPI. OSPI? Okay. Yeah, um, it's funny because the next 
RTMP implementation, I'm going to reverse engineer, it's called RTMP TE, which is encrypted. Yeah. And the reverse engineering encryption is a whole other ball game, so it might actually turn out to be worth finding Windows. Hmm. Okay. Well, sorry, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, his question was, do you usually see the standard checksums? Yeah, I think most people just seem to do it the same old way. Um, I have seen some protocols in the past that did it differently, but I think 99% of the network protocols I've ever worked at just do the, just add up everything. Um, sometimes the only difference is how many bytes they use to store the checksum, so you wind up with rollover. And that's actually where you can write good data analysis software for. You just munge it until you say, oh, this is the checksum. Cool, it means I lost everybody. Okay. How long is the reversion tool before you started working with that? What? How long is the reversion tool before you started working with Well, actually, funny enough, is, um, I initially reverse engineered it, and rather than trying to do it within the nature of Ganache, because you have other bugs and things, is I actually wrote standalone applications to do the exact same thing that was just the protocol. It made it a lot simpler, for instance, compiling and linking time, as well as other stuff. And so once I had it running standalone, we're actually now merging the standalone code into Ganache actually right now. Um, it was just a lot, y you want to eliminate all the other stuff that might be part confusing. Um, well, you can ask Ben this. I mean, we're a free software project, so it's not like we don't share. If he wants to use it, he's welcome to. <laughs> <laughs> we have different licensing issues. <laughs> yeah, I think rather than sharing code, I would say that we, we, sh we share a lot of information. Sometimes in reverse engineering, you can be wrong. And so having a different implementation with different focuses and different code bases is actually very, very useful. So everybody that says, oh, we should have one free Flash player project is crazy. It's actually better that we have two. It's okay. He's good at telling me what I do wrong, but we, it goes back and forth. <laughs> Yeah, as far as the next steps for what we're working on, it's um, getting the media server actually finished and out the door pretty soon. And we already have Flash 9 support. So a lot of our next steps is working on the ActionScript 3 library, which is rather large. It's a lot larger than the ActionScript 2 library. And so in the Ganache world, it's continuing to implement stupid Adobe bugs that don't make sense in an intelligent VM and things like that, and continuing with it fleshing out the, the size of the ActionScript class libraries. That's okay. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to repeat this in the microphone. <laughs> but, but in a sense, that's sort of what I kind of do. But I'm trying to fit this into 50 minutes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think comparing against known stuff is important. Taking something and modifying it and then sending it back in is, is very, very useful, like you just said. Yeah. Yeah, the Samba team's also been very motivating and, and encouraging me that you, we could actually do this legally.
Balmain has to be locked in within a very small neighbourhood delta of north of France. Yeah. I'm using not fighter line, but thick field, so four, six, seven. Different yeah. Um, I've actually worked on network protocols like that back when I was doing work at NASA, and it's a lot harder. <laughs> but luckily, most of them don't do that. Okay. Well, you were lucky in this case that they do that. And um, actually, yeah. <laughs> um, I did one that was like was EBCDIC to ASCII translations running off an IBM mainframe, and it was perverted. <laughs> but I actually had some documentation, which is the only reason I could figure that one out. But the documentation was 35 years out of date. <laughs> Yeah, because basically all the hex editors more or less just let you like edit the raw hex. But I know it sounds silly. I find putting carriage returns in, for instance, I know what the different data types are. And just separating all my sub-elements in a separate line already makes it easier to read. You can't do that in, in G-hex. That's why I wound up using Emacs. In that case, I only used OpenOffice so I could do color coding. I usually Emacs scratch buffers is a good thing. Hmm. I'd have to think about other features that would be useful in a binary editor. But being able to actually manipulate the file and do weird stuff with it would probably be useful. I mean, some things I might want to do would be weird stuff. Like, I've written software for this, like scan the file looking for you know, single bytes that appear in, in the exact same offset. For instance, in RTMP, everything's at 128 bytes in the beginning. And so, you know, oh, that's the next header of the next packet. They actually multiplex multiple packets in the same TCP IP channel, which is also very complicated. Yeah, I, I've never seen a good binary diff tool. Maybe that would be a good feature. Um, I wind up just doing the, the eyeball binary diff technique, which is kind of say, well, I stare at hex dumps until I figure out, oh, look, this one byte's different in this 3,000 byte packet. <laughs> um, Um, you know, funny enough is we don't get in that much legal trouble because we talk to the lawyers first. It turned out that when we had our first few meetings, we had by accident more or less done it the right way. Right. I'm pretty paranoid. But a lot of their information is more or less on, was on how to continue to work. And reverse engineering is one thing, but I actually want to be able to redistribute the results of my work. And that's actually where making sure that it's all done completely legally is useful. Otherwise, you wind up like FFmpeg, who, you know, as much as we all love their software and use it all the time, they've disassembled executables and they're not clean room, and so nobody will ship FFmpeg. So, in a sense, Ganache doesn't run because there's no codex for it. <laughs> Looks like I bored everybody to tears, so. <laughs> well, it depends. We actually have a lot of consumer electronics companies that are already shipping Ganache on hardware. Um, we actually, our predominant use of Ganache, believe it or not, is not a web browser plugin. So we don't care actually about YouTube a whole lot other than we make it work. Most of the users of Ganache are actually using it for video, multimedia enabled, um, consumer electronic devices typically playing. And so instead of using GNOME or KDE, you don't have that on a frame buffer type device. And so they do their user interface in Flash and then use Ganache to run it on their hardware. And so, but to be, to be honest, both Ganache and SwiftTech has the same problem. Depending what sites you go to, it works great. Or maybe you do a different list of sites and it doesn't work very well. And it's sort of, I mean, a lot of us use it as our only plugins, either of our two projects, and haven't had much trouble. And every once in a while, I come across sites that don't work. Uh, years ago, I looked at uh, SWS and was looking at the format, and I noticed there was OpenSWS. That was some, was that some macromedia attempt to try and make it all open? And 
Because it I seemed to document that uh, SWF was a format as how things are encoded, etc., etc., etc. Um, I guess when I started the Ganache project, there wasn't any publicly available documentation on any of this. They've been releasing more and more of their documentation lately, but that was mostly after lobbying them for probably two years straight. Yeah, because there was something there, but I just wanted you to use it, or you've never looked there, or... Well, I mean, as I... Well, for instance, it was like when Adobe finally released their ActionScript specifications. We had already figured it out and written our own documentation, so it was kind of a moot point. And I think a lot of the same thing for Swift files. A lot of other people have reverse engineered things, published their own versions of the docs. Most of what we learned, at least for the Ganache side, was looking at what other people did. Oh, here's the type field of AMF objects, that kind of thing. Um, but we've actually never used any of Adobe's documentation at all. It's more of a recent thing that they've been releasing stuff than, uh, than when we started the project. Yeah. I mean, it could be, but anytime I'm, anytime I'm web surfing and I come across adobe.com in a URL, I personally don't go there. <laughs> so. hmm. Well, there's osflash.org. That's another site. They have a lot of this kind of information. Part of the problem was that until the recently, like about last year when they released the action script specs, if you read the specifications, it says you cannot use this to implement a Flash player. So it kind of discouraged us from actually looking at any of it so that we could avoid the whole legal thing. Um, Adobe's been opening up about this a little bit, mostly because Silverlight is about to eat their lunch, but um, they're still kind of pretty tight. Yeah, we actually made a good use of a couple of people's sites that had, um, had sort of done this, taken the specs and changed things and put them up on the internet without licensing and stuff. And, um, but I mean, ActionScript is very much like JavaScript and ECMAScript. So we actually used the ECMA 262 spec a lot, even though it was different from ActionScript. It gave us the basic idea, like, here's how you format a date in you know, Gregorian time or something. Um, yeah, he asked about supporting H.264. I mean, because we use both GStreamer and FFmpeg, we supported H.264 for about a year before Adobe did. So um, it didn't really affect us at all. In fact, it may have worked the other direction. <laughs> Yeah, we actually run on more um, embedded devices than Adobe actually does. We support, oh man, PowerPC, Alpha, UltraSpark, PA Risk, several of the ARM variants, um, MIPS. We're very popular in MIPS-based uh, satellite control boxes, funny enough. Um, both Lamote and Gidium, who are building MIPS-based netbooks, are using Ganache now and things. And so Adobe mostly has been running on Intel architectures and the ARM only. And their Flash Lite product, which ran on the ARM, was actually a much older version of Flash. And so we find that we actually have better compatibility in the embedded space than even Adobe does with their own tools. They don't even do any of their own embedded work. It's actually subcontracted to another company. Yeah, we're a lot better on power management. The Adobe player wakes up like 800 times a second and kills your batteries in a world record time. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, and we're very big into making things event-driven and not kind of sucking your batteries down if you're not actually doing anything. Mind you, if you're watching YouTube, you're going to suck your batteries down with anything. But if you're using it for a user interface layer, if you're not clicking any buttons and nothing's happening, you don't want to actually do anything. You just want to wait for an event to happen. Only if people have more questions. Okay. You 
So I, I, I can't quite hear the um, I don't see Adobe making much of a legal push to do anything, but um, my talk Friday is going to talk. I mean, I'm actually doing a talk Friday called Why Open Media Matters, and I'm going to talk pretty heavily about proprietary formats and codec patents and a lot of sort of related issues. But Adobe doesn't care less. They like being proprietary, I think. Well, we'd like to think to get an ash is reasonably lightweight, yeah. But um, yeah, I've actually, I haven't done it for a little while, but at one point I was running Ganache on, you know, small machines with 266 megahertz and 64 mega memory, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually small these days. Um, I know that as we've put in a lot of work for Flash 9 support, we've kind of grown a little bit in size, but pretty much that's my next project after the release is to do some serious banging on memory allocation again. And we, we focus a lot more on keeping the footprint small, but sometimes when you're trying to push your code forward faster, you kind of sometimes have to like not worry about performance and then you get it working and then you go back and do a performance pass through it. Otherwise you go crazy. Um, I'll try really hard not to bash my friends at Ubuntu who completely space out updating your packages for large amounts of time. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, we have a real problem where a lot of the distributions don't actually grab every release. And for instance, in Ubuntu 8.4, it was a real problem. Um, we've actually recently added XPI packaging support to Ganache, so we can do auto updates in Firefox to try to work around this. But it's, it's a continual user perception problem with us. With 8.04, what happened was a, um, YouTube changed their player two weeks after the Ubuntu release came out. And it was a minor bug that took us an hour to fix, but then nobody updated it for six months. And it's an inability to push fixed versions of Ganache back out has been a real problem and as much as I hate to say it yeah going to uh, savannah.gnu.org and grabbing the latest source is usually the best way to keep it working um, the FSF pages to be honest are very limited because they're supposed to be very simple and so if you really want to get info on Ganache um, go to um, ganashedev.org ganashedev.org is the main site of the Ganache developers in our wiki and it's got for instance, all this technical information and RTMP is there and, and a lot of stuff like that. And the FSF pages don't change much because we're not supposed to. W every time we do a release, we change the version numbers, and that's about it. Oh, savannah.gnu.org 